Hello, this is uh, Brother Byron coming at you again with uh, my second episode of Rock Tower. Uh, in this episode, I want to talk about God, His attributes, as well as His personableness, and we'll get into all that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize. This video's come a little late. Um, in the in the week, I've been busy with work, been busy trying to get things done around the house, and I apologize for that. Try to take care of little Cooper and um, me. Me and Megan have been deep in prayer the past two days over where we want our life to go and and uh, how we want to share the gospel with other people here in Owensboro as well as throughout North America and the world. But uh, to God be the glory. Great things He has done and all things. As always, I promise that you will see Jesus in the fullness of His glory and in His grace. The Holy Spirit is our rock and strong tower, our great high tower who was and is and is to come. I just want to jump into scriptures about God's God's attributes and personableness from scripture. There are many of them, so bear with me. Uh, Colossians 1.17 says, And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Great is our Lord, and mighty in power is understanding his infinite. Psalms 147.5 Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. John 5, 26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Psalms 33, 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Deuteronomy 7, 9, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said... And will he not do? Or has he spoken? And will he not make it good? Psalms 116, 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. 2 Samuel 22, 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Acts 17, 25. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to life breath and all things. Isaiah 6, 3. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Revelation 4, 8. The, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's pray. Hello, Lamb, great Lamb of God. Help me to understand you better each day and every day that I yearn and worship for you. O oh, great eternal one, King Jesus, I thank you so much for your amazing love, awesome graciousness, and for your holy righteousness that stretches from everlasting to everlasting. Holy Spirit, I praise you for your transcendent and imminent nature that surrounds us all in your glory. Your impeccability and flawless nature derives, excuse me, drives me to sin no more and to love and honor you each day. God Almighty, not even the angels in glory can fathom your great incorporeal power. You are beyond any entity, any and all things, all phenomenon beyond any comprehension of man. You are impassable, O Lord, but Christ your Son suffered all things at Calvary and is the veracity of all blessing. El Shaddai, you are a jealous God and desire our worship and affection towards you. Your wrath is mighty and has destroyed Uzziah, Solomon's kingdom, and many nations for disobeying your holy will. May the elect be strong in the day you decide to test us in divine retribution towards you, King Jesus. No wrath was stronger than the blood shed on Calvary's cross for the sins of the world. Have mercy on me, a sinner, and have your own way in the precious name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So who exactly is God? Well, we typically call him Lord Jehovah or King Yahweh most of the time, but the best I can kind of crunch it down and describe it is he is like infinite power 
and a great spirit of love. That's kind of the first things that come to my mind when I tell people and teach people about God. Most Baptistic theology tends to describe these in terms of power or personalness within the Trinity. The Anglo-Saxon word for God has been described as like a great invoker or a great deity of the universe. But God himself is the creator of all causality, logic, and matter, and all existence, and all possible universes. Amen. What makes God essential to Christianity is that he is the author and finisher of our salvation. Christ is the resurrection and the life and gives faith to us. Without God, life would not and could not exist, nor would the salvific order be accomplished without the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit conceived in Mary to make Christ fully man and fully God, and God is spirit who was and is and who will be and who will be forever. Deeper believers know the Lord as a as the great co-eternal hypostasis, stasis, pardon me, of the redeeming lamb who is the essence of all life and was manifested and reconciled in Christ Jesus, the lamb. Praise God. So a lot of people ask me, and a question that begs to be answered is, why is it important to know God and who he is? Well, if we understand God's power and his person, primarily it will help us in many ways. First of all, in Psalms 46.10 and 1 Chronicles 28.9, it's a holy command from Scripture. We're to know God and study him. Eternal life depends on it, John 17.3. It helps us as believers to love God in more depth, Jeremiah uh, chapter 9, verses 28-24. Knowing him fervently, intellectually, and experimentally helps us grow spiritually, 2 Peter 3.18 and Philippians 3.10. It helps us know ourselves better, 1 John 3.10, Lamentations 3.40. It is cru a, excuse me, a crucial element to obtaining true worship, Romans 11.33 through verse 36, which I already touched on that topic in my previous episode. And it is a final realization of the judgment to come, Hosea 4.6. To live a life pure and upright, it behooves us believers to intimately and seriously understand God Almighty. God also has many attributes that define him and show us his power through scripture and divine revelation, which I've already touched on that. A lot of these topics haven't really been touched on in Protestant thought, and I want to look at what other believers across the faith see God and see if there is a co-equivalency within Protestant doctrine that we could look at this as the true faith and true doctrine would have us to if we could pray and explore These subjects in greater detail. First of all, God is the great acidity or the self Derivation God self derives himself. He is the every of everies. That's how every he gets I know as a joke. I had to slide that in there God was the great uncaused he has always existed, even before existence itself. He has always been self-sufficient before sufficiency was even created. What an awesome God we serve. Acts 17, 25 proves this. He is eternal, which means he is encompassed in all time, and God is the eternal one. His laws and ways are eternal, and he will be here before and after time begins, and he will start from what he has been. Psalms 92 this can also be explained as God is eternal over his own eternity and eternal in his immensity as well. And we'll touch on that in a minute. King Solomon describes this in 1 Kings 8.27 as the highest heavens could not contain him. God is gracious. Psalms 86.15 God grants all of us unmerited divine assistance and free undeserving favor towards all humanity. He is forever more worthy of praise for this. He is full of compassion for all. 2 Chronicles 39. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. God is sacred. That's what holy means. Now, a lot of times we make a distinction like holy is like a spirit, like something spiritual that is not of this earth, like an angel is holy. But God is supreme holiness. Sort of like, you know, we will be holy when we, we come into heaven ourselves. We will no longer be of this earth one day. But God's holiness is a separate type of holiness in and of itself. And it, it behooves us to understand that in greater detail as we seek to study and learn more about God. God is true consecration and the utmost sanctification above all else in his holiness. Isaiah 6, 3. He is imminent. He declares to the world that he has sold divine presence everywhere. 
God has no sense of non-interestedness or non-abstraction from existence to the creation he has made. God is always interested and God is always concrete, even if he would exist abstractly from his creation. He is always here divinely and presently. Psalms 97.5 and Acts 17.28 prove this. God is also the great consistency of the universe, or in other words, he has total immutability. Mutability. Sorry, I was a mouthful. He is the great unchange of all. This attribute has been argued over in recent time by theologians across Reformed circles and Baptistic ones also. Open theists argue that if God is truly unchangeable in all ways, then prayers, decisions, or humanistic acts should be for nothing for God. Close theists like Bavnik from the Dutch Reformed tradition argue that God does not, in fact, over time... Uh, God does, in fact, over time get angry, repent, and change his purpose, pardon me, but but that relationally, experimentally, he is constant in all he seeks to do and all he has done. I would argue that God has ultimate free will, which man does does not, but also God is totally immo is not a immobile or sterile God, but the Holy Trinity is mobile and fecund in all ways, which means God is all life and God can alter all life. It may not be necessitated necessarily or absolutely required, but God has the power to do that. God show, uh, I guess that shows some of my Calminian instinct when I preach and teach, I guess. Uh, but this is an antinomy. It's an antinomous doctrine and it plays into the mystery of God itself. Remember, his ways are not our ways. James 1.17, Hebrews 13.18. Christ is the utmost impeccability. God has no sin, nor does he have any vice to be considered actual or any ability to sin as well. But I will remind you uh, out there that the Holy Spirit conceived of Mary and he had no biological father. Christ Almighty was the only human being who was conceived without sexual gratification, which made him immune of sin. But because of Mary's flesh and Mary's DNA and everything on her, her blood right, that God was also man of itself. Once again, a great mystery in of itself. But also... God, that's what made God able to die at Calvary because he had that sense of humanity with him within that triune relationship. Uh, but whenever God prays or decrees something, he, he didn't admit to sin or confess to sin or he wouldn't be God anymore to avoid that pitfall. The Holy Spirit is proof enough that God is a great incorporeality or that he is beyond carnal nature. We see this in scripture in Exodus when he was the burning bush and the gospels during the transfiguration. We also see this as uh, the angel of God or the great spirit of God whenever he shows himself to the prophets in Old Testament times. He was also a great pillar of cloud and fire within the Mosaic books as well as the Torah. We see God in many forms uh, throughout the Old and New Testament respectively and in modern time that God could, could be in any form he choose to but he's still Jehovah. And my favorite topic, God is pure and holy love, the deepest sense of love and existence. It is stronger than any, any two human beings or any group of humans could ever pledge or produce sentiment or affection for. 1 John 4, 8 and 16 declares that God is love, which is a divine, unmoving, unchanging, mysterious, deep love. Praise God for it. Theologically and historically, there have been three ways that... Uh, in Old Testament, New Testament example from Hebrew and Greek, that love has been ex that has been explained to to Christians throughout the centuries. First, God is omnibenevolent; He expresses His love omnibenevolently, or that God has a general love for all humanity and all mankind. We clearly see that. Secondly, God has a love that is beneficial, or is in a sense that God loves His elect and His Son in a deep, serene love, but it's at a co-equal measure with His omnibenevolence. Some scholars have called this like a deep attitude or sense of love that God has for his children and this inner triune love that God has. Like God loves Jesus, Jesus loves the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit loves God, and they all share in this in this trifecta of love, if you will. So thirdly, and I think it's cool that this is in threes too, that God has a sense of love that is unconditional towards the salvation of others, that it can never be touched or appropriated in a negative fashion. 
D.A. Carson from Montreal explained it as, it is a self-giving and free love to the world. He also says it's effectual and unique for, for his elect and is lavished by the obedience of all those who accept the salvific stance of love that Christ accomplished at Calvary. Man, what a boss quote. I love it. Uh, these are explained like agape, habib, and filio in scripture. And I think there's more derivatives of love that kind of mean the same thing, but that's kind of for a sermon for another time and get deeper into that because it's kind of a beefy theological discussion. But when I listen to Sproul and others talk about it, they say that God couldn't love anyone unconditionally because that would let you do whatever you want to. And I know a lot of high Calvinists kind of condemn that, but God calls us to repent because he loves us. God seeks the evil pe person or the ones who shed blood or the violent and the sinful because he loves them. I remind you that God sent Jonah to Nineveh when they were adulterating and, and cursing God out loud and hating God's people, but he still loved them. And God loved the, the people who whipped him and put the crown of thorns on his head. Christ loved them that he gave them air to breathe and loved them so much. If that ain't love, I don't know what is. I, I'm kind of choking up talking about this, but it's just so awesome. God is also a missional God. The Great Commission proves this, and it's simply any, any effort to, to glorify and spread the teachings of God. That's why God calls us to missions. Christ had a mission to go to Calvary. God had a mission to create the earth and to sustain the universe and all existence. The Holy Spirit had a mission to help to help the gospel, to help the early church, and to help the church grow and plant and, and spread seeds of wildfire, like, like the faith of a mustard seed. Amen. El Olam is omnipotent or all-powerful. Matthew 19, 26 says this when Jesus says that nothing is impossible with God. I remember reading uh, The Problem of Pain that C.S. Lewis wrote in 1966 where he said that God couldn't do the extrinsically impossible. I disagree with this. God is able to do the intrinsically possible and impossible. For example, if God wanted to turn dirt jello, he certainly could do that. Now, would that is that necessitated or serve a purpose? No, it doesn't. But God has the power to do that, and it doesn't take away from his love if he doesn't do that. But I would say that, the Almighty is capable of any act or solution to become for, that becomes for him. Um, God is capable of sensical and nonsensical power, and his power is not lacking. Amen. God is omnipresent or everywhere. He is above and below the reaches of space and time and is always present in the triune Godhead. This ties into his immensity as well. A lot of these attributes and personable issues with God sort of go hand in hand because if God is the great eternal one, then eternity is everything in and of itself. And, it, you know, he's the first and the last, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, to quote scripture, you know, you know, just on, on, the, on the ribbon cut right there, you know, kind of linchpin that in there. Um, he is oneness, unified and inseparable, one and forever and simple. He is providential. He has a general providence to maintain the universe and all realms throughout all firmaments of existence. And he has a special providence where he intervenes lovingly for his people. Going further in this, he is also transcendent, which means he's outside space and time. Isaiah 57, 15 proves this, where God balances his eminence and transcendence. Uh, and it's also ties in his immunity as well. I've already touched on the Trinity. A good book for that would be uh, Gill's uh, 1731 uh, pamphlet regarding this, that his essence sort of unifies that in there. Uh, to be a Christian, you have to be a Trinitarian Christian, no questions asked, plain and simple. It's the way it is. God cannot lie, Titus 1, 2, Terses. He is the great veracity of all human beings. God is a jealous God. God is a God of wrath, too. Deuteronomy 9, uh, after the incident with the golden calf, Moses described, you know, how he feared the furious anger of the Lord. He turned against him. But he also praises God's wrath in Exodus as well. Moses does. 
But uh, Wayne Grudem, also, if you read his material, he also says that God loves all that is right and good, and that he confirms to his moral character that it should not be surprising and he would hate everything that is opposed to his moral character, because God is a God of justice. So that sort of goes intertwined with you know his wrath to the stuff that he hates and that he goes against. I'm going to tie in again, God is a jealous God. Packer, uh, bless his heart, he just went to be with the Lord not too long ago, sees God's jealousy as his zeal to protect a loving relationship or to avenge what is broken, and which makes it an aspect of his covenant love for his own people. Amen. So, God is many things. He is personal, and he is infinite. And I think... We can go on a limb and say this because our rock tire is a strong and mighty God in this. But like I mentioned before, it's important to know God because it helps us you know, have a relationship with Christ. I strongly urge you, if you're uh, following my, my, my podcast, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I hope this is the day you'll accept him. Uh, accept him into your heart. Turn from your sin and trust in the Lord your God. Amen. Father God, I just praise you for this this podcast, Lord, I praise you for for your saints having the ability to speak and preach your word, for us to assimilate and pour over your word. It is holy, it is upright. I thank you for your attributes, and I thank you for your holy personage. Father God, King Jesus, I just praise you for being a, a God that always is full of mercy and compassion and tender mercy. I thank you for my wife, Megan. I thank you for my home. I thank you for the blessings of life, the ability to breathe and use my senses. I pray that you be with everyone in my in my apartment building, that you be with everyone in this city. Lord, I pray that you be with the protesters that were downtown, Lord. Cast out their hate, and may they call urgently and nobly unto you, Father God, God of all gods, ruler of all rulers, your immensity among immensities. You're the every of all everies. Praise you for all you've done, all you're going to do. You are who is, who is now, and who is to come, and who will come, Father God. Just forgive me of my sins. I ask this all in your precious name, I pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Catch you on the flip side. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.